Good evening, Endo Summit Live, and welcome to the first edition of this year's season. Tonight, we are discussing bowel endometriosis. Please welcome Dr. Gabby Mawad and Dr. Abhishek Mangus Shikar. Dr. Mangus Shikar, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, Dr. Sally, and good to see you again, Gabby. It's been a while. I am a gynecological surgeon based out of Mumbai, India. I run an endometriosis center, which acts as a very large primary referral center for endometriosis care in India and most of Asia. And I lead a multidisciplinary team um, that deals with endometriosis and my major interest is in bowel endometriosis and parametrial endometriosis affecting the sacral nerves as well. Very, very exciting. Please welcome also Dr. Gabby Mawad. Dr. Mawad, can you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, it's a great kick for uh, Endo Summit uh, with you, Sally and uh, Abhishek. Uh, I'm Gabi Mawad. Uh, I'm a GYN surgeon located in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I do run the Center for Endometriosis and Advanced Pelvic Surgery. Uh, in this area, we do uh, have a multidisciplinary team that takes care of uh, patients with uh, endometriosis. Primary focus, neuropelviology, sciatic, sacral uses bowel and diaphragm so uh all of it basically <laughs> all of it yes yes so uh bowel we're talking bowel endometriosis tonight about how many of your patients do you see have bowel endometriosis um so we just looked at our statistics of the cases that i did over the last year um, so the previous year was almost 50% who had bowel endometriosis, and this year, uh, maybe about 64%, I think, was the last numbers. And you're abroad. So, Dr. Mawad, how many are you seeing with bowel endometriosis? You may not have fancy statistics like garbage check, <laughs> but, you know. But... No, no, about 50% of the patients comes out uh, with bowel endometriosis. Now, bowel endometriosis, when we talk about it, it does not require segmental resection. It could be uh, smaller nodules on the bowel that could go with shaving, uh, but around 50% of our patients presents with bowel endometriosis. So let's talk about what are some of the symptoms and also, um, Abhishek, I know you do a lot of work with this. How would you, something lead you to believe somebody had bowel endometriosis? Is there testing? Is there, you know, what do you do with that? Yeah, that's great. I think you started the questioning in the right way, where you, the patient's symptoms are one of the key telltale signs. So it's very important to sit down with that particular patient and, you know, not run a consult in five minutes. You have to give, do your due diligence and sit with them for, you know, a long time, get the proper history. So the most common symptoms associated with bowel endometriosis are you ask for a increase or decrease in frequency. So they may have constipation. They may have loose stools like diarrhea. Uh, bloating is a very uh, common symptom of bowel endometriosis. Upper bowel may also present with nausea. I mean, it so can lower bowel, but especially vomiting right after meals is a very telltale sign of there may be something in the upper bowel. And, um, you know, pain during intercourse, especially deep dyspareunia, uh, pain on deep penetration rather, would be something that is a very telltale sign of most likely the rectum being stuck to the back of the vagina. So that is something to consider. And one of the most worrying symptoms for parametrium, so for lateral bowel disease, when it starts affecting the parametrium and the pelvic nerves, is if somebody is unable to void their bladder completely and they have to push down on the abdomen to void urine. So that is a sign that the, it's not a sign of bladder endometriosis, rather it's a sign that a bowel nodule is growing onto the parametrium and affecting the nerves supplying the bladder. Yeah, and I would like to add one thing, which is the tenesmus, something that 
the cramping before ha having a bowel movement. It's like the patients have an urgency to go and have a bowel movement with mm -hmm. severe cramp preceding the, uh, the bowel movement. That is one also common signs that patients with bowel endometriosis do experience. So if somebody comes to your office, I, I want to let some, because we talk a lot about um, what the journey is like with the endometriosis summit. So how many um, in your office come to you and automatically they were diagnosed with a bowel endometriosis right off the bat? How many doctors do you think they've seen by the time they get to you? And it's too probably very different because you're in two different countries. Well, I believe most of the time the patient does suspect bowel endometriosis before other physicians uh, did put the diagnosis. A uh, patient comes to us most of the time after seeing a gastroenterologist, after seeing multiple gynecologists, after being pushed in different kind of uh, diseases, IBS or uh, uh, you know SIBO or a lot of things. And then uh, they know they have bowel endometriosis, but they need somebody to listen to them and then to diagnose them with bowel endometriosis. I believe I tell my patients, they know their body better than any physician. So that's why uh, the most important thing is to take a good history and listen to the patient's symptoms. The prince has arrived. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I agree with what Gabby said. It's a lot. So almost zero patients will come in and say, look, I've been diagnosed with a bowel nodule. You need to do a resection. So that never happens. And most of them have already seen a bunch of doctors on an average, had two surgeries before. And if you're lucky, you get some images of the surgery and you see that the rectum is stuck to the back wall of the uterus. And that's your first giveaway that there's something in the bowel. Well, on an average, they would you know, say um, they have these symptoms and it's kind of almost cathartic for them to be able to have that diagnosis that this is not psychosomatic disease or manifested disease. And you're able to do that diagnosis because bowel endo, the big nodules are usually very easily seen on ultrasound or MRI. So it's very important. And it's part of my workup in the outpatient that I do my own ultrasound and I do my own MRI, uh, read my own MRI rather. So I think for them to be able to have that diagnosis in place is, is kind of bittersweet because it basically means that they have significant disease, but they also at least have a diagnosis. So it's... Um... And it, it is very important for the patient also to know that many times they get a fragmented care. Whenever they complain about something bowel, they are referred to a gastroenterologist or uh, another specialty. It's very important for the patient to voice their bowel symptoms when they suspect themselves pain during their period or pain during... Uh, uh, intercourse, I believe many of the time, a lot of the general uh, physicians forget to ask them about these symptoms specifically, and patients think this is not something really important to uh, to mention because it might not be the specialty of a GYN surgeon. So joining us this evening is also my co-host, who was nine minutes late, um, Dr. Andrea Vidali. Dr. Vidali does a lot of fertility work. And, um, you know, we talk about that for silent infertility is usually not that silent. How many of your recurrent miscarriage patients are coming in and they're normalizing their bowel symptoms? Wait, wait, Dr. Vidali, we have a uh, problem with your mic. Okay. You sound like you're underwater. Doesn't he? By the way, let I think he's lost about 70 pounds since the last Endo Summit. So we should all give him a big hand because it's a big deal to do that. Doesn't he look great? Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to you while you're dealing with your tech. Um, so let's talk about it. Dr. Manga Shikar, you... Um, do imaging very specifically for bowel endometriosis. Yeah, that's oh, true. I, I read MRIs. Actually, I, it's, I enjoy it. So a lot of patients send me MRIs. So it's not it's not an Indian problem specifically. It's an international problem. So 
I saw a patient from Sweden yesterday who spoke to me and she said, okay, I have cysts in my ovaries. And then I said, can you send me your MRI? And it's a huge nodule in the bowel, uh, which is almost subocclusive. And this, these centers across the world try to be very up to date. So they put an Indian score and they wrote that, the, which is how uh, one of the staging systems for endometriosis. And they said, there's no disease in the bowel. And I said, and I called up the radiologist of hers and she was in the emergency room. And I was like, this uh, patient needs serious help because the nodule is almost obstructing the bowel and she needs emergency surgery. So do not think that this is just an adhesion of the bowel. It's something much more severe. So it's, it's like I said, the diagnosis is not uh, usually picked up by a lot of radiologists from what I've seen across the world. It is, there is a desperate need for patient-centered and endo rather specialty-centered imaging and treatment facilities. Doctor, go ahead, Dr. Mawad. No, I completely agree. And this is where it becomes really sensitive matter because when the patient received their, uh, their MRI uh, report and it says it's negative for endometriosis or it's within normal limits and then patients have been consulting multiple doctors, she ought to feel like depressed. And when they come to us and we say like, oh, you have an audio on the bowel. Now, now there is something, a conflict in the with the patient. Who does she believe? The radiologist, which his job is to read reports or this GYN surgeon that is telling her that you need surgery because your bowel is almost occluded. And then the other issue, at least in the U.S., becomes who does the insurance company believe? Because if one says one thing and one says the other thing, then what, right? It's, it's, a, it's a whole issue. I think it's a broken system on multiple levels from the GYN to the radiologist to the pathologist. We have these recurrent issue coming all over and over. We should just stop having radiologists read MRIs and just use artificial intelligence and that's it. I mean, uh, honestly, that's how we should be. Just today, I saw a somebody, and, and uh, she had two MRIs. This person, and and on the first MRI, there was a lesion that they clearly saw, and the second MRI, the lesion was still there, and the second reading did not see the first lesion. I just I just emailed the radiologist now, and uh, AI would have picked on that on that easily. I mean, luckily, in the next two or three years, all these MRIs will be read by artificial intelligence and we won't have this problem anymore. That's what I think. I hope so, at least. You know, humans, they just don't have that level of attention. We see it as gynecologists because we know what we're looking for specifically. But I think these radiologists who are every five minutes are looking at something different, 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 looking for different things. They just don't have that level of attention. I, I don't know if you guys agree on this, but let's go with artificial intelligence and, and that's it. That's what I think. <laughs> We do have a followers choice um, endometriosis summit webinar. You could choose to talk about artificial intelligence on that one um, team. So uh, where someone comes to you, they have bowel pain, maybe they have a positive MRI, maybe the disease is superficial and there's nothing there, then what? Then what happens? So we talked about shaving versus resection. Um, how do you um, proceed through a case? How do you make decisions about what's going to happen? We'll ask you first, Dr. Mawad. So for us, it's true that uh, uh, shaving versus resection keeps coming up as a, as a topic and a common question. But I, I want patients to know that we don't decide those kind of, we don't make those kind of decision based on surgeon preference. It's, uh, there are clear guidelines on when to do shaving and when to do segmental and when to do discoid. And discoid is removal a portion of the wall of the bowel rather than a segment of the bowel with the segmental resection. So if we have lesions that are confined to the muscle of the bowel without infiltrating the mucosa, that takes less than 45% of the circumference of the bowel, then potentially shaving might be a viable option if it is a solitary nodule or one nodule only, not multiple nodules in the proximity of each other's. For segmental resection, definitely subocclusive bowel disease or any nodule or 
an endometrioma of the bowel that is more than 50% of the circumference is uh, definitely uh, uh, an indication for segmental resection. Or if we have multiple nodules in proximity to each other, what we call multicentric disease or multifocal disease, then segmental will become the safest option rather than doing multiple shaving or multiple discoid excisions. So the decision to be made is based on the surgeon's knowledge of the different variables, the thickness, the width, the depth of the lesions uh, within the bowel. It's not an erratic science. Now, there are a lot of situations where things are in between the guidelines, where you surgeons based on experience could make those decisions intraoperatively, but usually the variability between the preoperative findings and discussion with a patient and intraoperative finding should be extremely minimal in endometriosis ex with endometriosis experts. Yes. Yeah, so for people who find this absolutely fascinating, like I do on our YouTube channel, you can see Dr. Mawad do an entire hour on um, resection versus shaving. And he has amazing diagrams and videos. And it actually, I didn't know this till I looked today. It's our most viewed YouTube. <laughs> it's our most viewed YouTube is what to do with bowel endometriosis. So Dr. Mangus Chikar, do you have anything to add about um, what, what to do with the lesion? Sure. I think Gabby summed it up perfectly. We have very standardized approaches to bowel nodules um, where you divide it into conservative, which is the shaving or the disc excision for the anterior wall lesion. Uh, and you would reserve segmental resections only for uh, the big occlusive lesions or multiple lesions in close proximity. And I want to add to patients that, you know, a lot of them will ask me that, are you going to do a, a colostomy or bag? And so we don't do prophylactic stomas anymore, uh, except for very, very ultra low resections. And when we talk about bowel resections for endometriosis, they're much more different from what the colorectal surgeons do for colon cancer. We, are, we maintain the fat, we maintain the uh, blood supply in the mesentery as much as possible. So the joining of the bowel or the anastomosis is well vascularized. And our patients are generally younger than colon cancer patients who are non-smokers. And these really help in reducing complication rates for the anastomosis. So the benefit of a prophylactic stoma is completely lost in these patients. And it's not well tolerated by a lot of patients as well. So there have been randomized trials showing that there is no benefit of doing a prophylactic stoma as long as you follow certain techniques. And now uh, with Gabby, I have been working on uh, publishing a series of uh, natural orifice cases where we even avoid a uh, mini laparotomy to exteriorize the bowel and complete the resections completely minimally invasively. I did not know the two of you were partnered for that. I can't wait till that. Are you, I hope you're coming back when that comes out, when that's published. We yeah, will my, my, be my, happy I, to come back. I, I, I love natural orifice. You know, my issue is that it's, I mean, in my experiences, it's a bit time consuming because you just got to, depending on a large, you know, how much space you have, you really have to trim it down. And sometimes this is my experience has been that, um, uh, by the time you cut out all the fat around to make it small, the sample smaller, if you have like a tiny incision on the skin that you just probably just a tiny bit and that one you could pull and stretch a little bit more. So I'm very curious to see what your experience yeah. with that is. But oh, we, we I, did, were... I did love uh, Mario Malzoni did a beautiful case. He presented AGL this year, right? That was a lovely presentation. That was really great. We actually were concerned about that as well. We're like, is it going to add operative time? But we found out that the time we save from creating and then repairing the mini laparotomy was less. So our operative time has decreased. Whether you do it via transanal approach, which is through the rectum itself, or if you have the vagina open through a colpotomy or after hysterectomy, uh, it, it reduces the time. Of course, if you have the vagina open, then it's yeah. logical. Yeah, the transanal approach also of saves course. a good time. That's logical. Yeah. I'm talking about when you're not doing a hysterectomy. Otherwise, otherwise it's logical. 
So we had a couple of questions on this. Um, we've been running like previews for a few days. Um, what is recovery time with um, the different techniques of the bowel like? Well, for me is uh, whenever you do anything on the bowel, if it, the, the, the recovery is not dependent on how much we do things inside the abdomen. The recovery, depending on how clean is the surgery, how short is the surgery. And if you have a standardized approach, you do a segmental resection in two hours. It's better than doing a simple excision in four hours. The patient tend to recover way faster. Now, most definitely when we do stuff on the bowel, the patient needs to be optimized before that, especially when we do segmental resection, because we would give the patient special medication to enhance the recovery of the bowel and then the function of the bowel faster. So that means we can shorten the time of stay of the patient in the hospital rather than traditionally three or four days now. They can go back, they can spend two nights at the hospital and leave, uh, hopefully with no uh, complication. And then the whole uh, enhanced recovery protocol helps the patient a lot uh, turning over the first rougher four or five days after surgery. And then recovery is very subjective and very genetic uh, dependent on the genes of the patient, their immune system, their age, their prior, their history of prior surgery, if they're surgically naive or they had multiple prior surgery. So it's a complex equation, but the fortunate thing with endometriosis patients, they are all young and healthy and they tend to recover and bounce back really well. And I've, I've heard it many times from patients saying like, I wish I knew surgery. It was that easy compared to my every month pain. I would have made that decision way earlier than this. And Dr. Mangeshirkar, anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when a patient has a diagnosis of bowel endometriosis, at least in my practice, when they have when they consult their family physician or their the gynecologist at home, they who are not experienced with this, they say, oh, you're going to end up with a colostomy. You're, it's a huge, dangerous surgery. But like Gabby rightly said, when these standard when these techniques are standardized and there are high volume centers dealing with this, the outcomes of surgery are probably much better than the not incomplete surgeries that they went through before. So the recovery process is standardized. We know how to monitor these patients in the post-operative period. We know what to look for in cases of complication so we can act as quickly and judiciously as possible to reduce as much morbidity as we can uh, in, those, in those circumstances. And then itself, the surgical techniques are so kind of honed down to reduce any morbidity and complications that may be associated with these kind of procedures. We also need to talk about long-term recovery because whenever you're dealing with a segmental resection, um, you're talking about, okay, the immediate post-surgical time of recovery, but then there is the recovery that deals with uh, the return of normal bowel function. And that's like on the long-term. And uh, that's a, a complex process. And uh, just as uh, Gabby was mentioning earlier, it depends significantly on, it's a very individualized response because what happens when you cut out a piece of bowel, you're also sort of denervating that piece of bowel. So like there, there's a missing part there. And, and whenever the bolus, the feces arrive in that place, you know, whatever would take the time to transit it, it does, it's not there anymore. So two things can happen. It could be that when, you know, the stool that gets there says, oh, wait a second, there's, I, there's, there's a piece missing here and it could stop there, okay? Or the second reaction could be, oh, there's nothing here. So let me just go really fast through it. So you'll see that um, there's different reactions where some people develop constipation postoperatively. And other people develop these like sort of, you know, like they, as soon as they feel the stimulus to go to the bathroom, they immediately have to sort of run. So there is certainly an adaptive uh, process where it takes time for people to adjust their bowel function. And it, it could take months. We don't, and what I tell patients is that it could be a few weeks, it could be months, it could be seven months. 
but one day somehow things will just get better on their own and you'll and your function will come normal but this is i think the one part in terms of recovery that is a little bit harder to predict in my experience i don't know if you guys feel the same way yeah absolutely that's true long term is unpredictable but there i mean we've attempted to use the gastrointestinal quality of life index scores to kind of track tailor that and track that over time uh, I think one of the important factors, well, this is more specific for resections only, is how far you are from the anal verge, which is the where the sphincters lie. So if the nodules are higher up in the mid-rectum or in the rectosigmoid, then there is very little change in the sphincter control, uh, and the patients have an excellent quality of life regarding their, their bowel habits. The low, the ultra-low resections, which thankfully are uh, a little rare in my practice. Uh, they, those are the ones that may have um, long-term uh, bowel complications like a low anterior resection syndrome. But of course, we know how low the nodule is at imaging. So this is a very important to have conversation to have with the patient before surgery and say that, look, I can find the nodule at this level. My resection is probably going to be low. And these are the possible outcomes you may endure short term and long term. And one, one other thing I realized, the, the concomitant presence of parametrial disease is very impactful on the return to bowel function because we then have to dissect the hypogastric nerve. We're going to damage uh, some of the uh, branches of the inferior hypogastric plexus, which are the nerves that feeds the top of the vagina, the bladder, and the the bowel, and that might have the that might follow the the recovery of nerves to get back the full bar function, which could take up to six to nine months the recovery of nerve itself. So I think now knowing more about the nerve and performing a nerve sparing surgery helped us many times in preventing the longer term uh, uh, disasters. Uh, but also dissecting the nerve does not come without a price because the nerves gets very irritated easily and they will be falling into different stages like the neuropraxia where the nerve does not behave really well that will be associated with the slower in bowel function and then the nerve gets hyper excitable that will be associated with more bowel movement until it, uh, it uh, readjusts. Plus, we should not dismiss the impact of the heavy bowel preps that is done on the flora of the bowel. So we encourage our patients to take probiotic as soon to help restoring the uh, normal flora after the longer surgery, much antibiotics, IV, and then uh, the bowel prep that damages the normal uh, colonic flora of the bowel or the normal bacteria that helps the bowel function well. So patients tend to have less gases, less bloating after these type of surgeries. Abhishek, any comment on your part with regards to post-op diet instead? Because I know there's different recommendations. Some, some doctors say soft diet. Some people say avoid avoid fibers. What's, what's your perspective on this, uh, on post-surgical bowel surgery diet? So post-operative. Yeah. What that's, is what do you recommend your patients? So immediately postoperatively, we will start clear fluids the next day, and um, once we have uh, they're progressing and tolerating the fluids well, we also monitor bloods to look at electrolytes and correct the potassium as needed to avoid the ileus from handling the bowel, which is the slowing of the intestines, which can cause a lot of bloating and discomfort. Uh, once we have corrected all of that and the patient is tolerating fluids, then we step up the diet onto full liquids and then onto a soft diet, which is not much chewing. And where by usually by the time day three, they are on a full diet. So I don't usually have any dietary restrictions for patients unless they have obvious food uh, sensitivities or food allergies and they're able to tolerate food and they have no ileus. So we uh, kind of scale the diet according to how well they're recovering from surgery. So you basically term, tell them eat whatever you want. Don't worry about fiber, high fiber, low fiber. Do you ever tell them to adjust that in, in case they get constipated or anything like that? 
so constipated yes i will say gallon of water a day and um, you can kind of ease back on the fiber a little bit or if you're taking high fiber you have to drink a lot of water to be able to process that so yeah that's generally the rule of thumb we also i do consult with a nutritionist on some of these things and my colorectal also uh, does uh, consult on these cases too. So the chronic constipation patient um, is, you know, typically they're going to have residual um, pelvic floor dysfunction. So, but also when you talk about nerve and and the body reintegrating a nerve into um, how it works and how it fires, and I I will tell you. Um, the, we are, this is the case where the physical therapist doesn't love the patient on the high fiber diet because we feel like, and I don't know if it's the, you know, overreacting because we're not surgeons, but that in some way it's going to tug on the resection because it's going to bulk the stool. And that's going to be really painful because it's going to trigger that nerve in one way or another to have that stool so bulked. Um, I don't know if I made, I didn't make it up. I definitely learned that, or, and I've definitely retaught that, but I don't know from a surgeon's perspective, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. I just love what you just said, actually. I pay him to say these things. So, yeah, I, I also think, you know, we could do an entire hour on that, but what, um, Dr. Mawad was talking about, about the nerves, um, the hypogastric nerves and the pelvic nerves and the bowel. I think it's that dance that leads to endobelly almost more than the disease itself. What I had an entire live on this with Dr. Mangishikar, but I'm going to let you both comment on that. Which regarding, so yeah, Gabby segued beautifully into bowel disease invading the parametrium. Those are the most difficult nodules to treat uh, because the parametrium you have your hypogastric nerve, which joins the inferior hypogastric plexus where you get your pelvic, plank, pelvic splanchnic nerves. And that goes and gives you, uh, along with the sacral nerves, the S234, they join in and give fibers to the sciatic nerve. So these patients can prevent, present with severe pain running down the back of the glute, down the hamstring to the, to the leg. And that is uh, very typical of, it doesn't mean that there's a primary sciatic nodule, it can be a sacral nerve nodule that is transmitting uh, impulses along that nerve uh, route. So these patients, and the most dangerous thing of doing this surgery, as Gabby beautifully said, there is the irritation and sensitivity of the nerves. And what I always worry about in these patients is bladder function, because I will tell the patient that they're, even though it's one-sided, it's usually one-sided, uh, the nodule moving to the right or the left, is going to have a difficulty to void bladder af after uh, surgery. So they may, not, they may have sensation, but they may not be able to empty their bladder. So they might have to ca uh, catheterize themselves for usually two to four weeks after surgery. So this is again, a discussion to be had before surgery when you have that nodule going laterally. And I've had one case where the nodule was so big that infiltrated both parametrium, and it was very, very difficult for the patient to avoid after that. They had to use a tremendous amount of abdominal force to, to pass urine and intermittent self-catheterization as well. No, I, I believe that this is one thing that I see recurrently being uh, mistakenly mentioned. The uh, Any lesion that is in proximity up to three centimeters from a nerve could stimulate the nerve. So when we talk about the nerve pain and the neuropelviology, it does not mean endometriosis is lying directly on the nerve. It could be up to three centimeter in proximity. And that was really beautifully uh, demonstrated by a paper by Philippe Konix uh, two years ago that talks about like how the pelvic nerves gets irritated with the inflammation of endometriosis that is in proximity. And I think that's why peritoneal disease is in proximity of the hypogastric nerve. The hypogastric nerve is few millimeters away from the peritoneum. That's why many of the patient with peritoneal disease even could have bla bladder dysfunction, sensation of incomplete emptying of the bladder, uh, increased urinary frequency, 
bowel dysfunction, many times we see bowel dysfunction that does not mean there is endometriosis directly on the bowel or there is a nodule of endometriosis on the bowel. It could be simply that the hypogastric plexus is irritated and simulating those uh, symptoms closer to the elevator ani muscle could simulate painful defecation. And then these patients usually should be sent to a pelvic floor therapist straight away after surgery because these have super spastic levator ani if they have endometriosis in proximity, even minimal. We're not talking about deeply infiltrative of endometriosis. Minimal endometriosis could cause so much damage uh, and then could imitate or mitigate different kind of uh, a disease, organ disease. Wonderfully said, especially good, and just as a segue of what Sally just said, is that what you describe is really the pathophysiologist, pathophysiology of a lot of this, what's going on, which is that it starts as an inflammatory process, it becomes physiologic, it affects physiologically the nerves, and, and the, that, that alters the motility of the intestine. And the alteration in motility causes a dysbiosis, which ultimately SIBO and so on. And that's really sort of the, the, the pathophysiology of the process. And what I find even more fascinating, and I was I put I made it yesterday a post on, on Instagram about this, how this dysbiosis uh, in the intestine also affects uh, uh, us at a higher level, at a cortical level, uh, in, in ter- behaviorally in terms of mood, depression, um, uh, desire to exercise. It appears that all these alterations in bacteria then affect everything else. And that, and, and kind of puts it together, you know, holistically, if you will, of what the endometriosis holistic syndrome really is. You know, I now, think- really Dr. Vidali, we were on with Alexandra Millspa last week on Instagram who um, flat out, who's a psychologist, um, and uh, she does a lot of cognitive behavioral work, but who flat out um, has um, research and has studied the neuroinflammation that's driven actually by the microbiota and um, how that her, her area of expertise is the stress of the disease itself, making that um, whole um, microbiome and everything worse. So you should check out that Instagram live um, I won't. on your <laughs> own. So you should have, yeah. So the, um, the other thing I think uh, I can speak as a patient who had all of this going on, we, you know, patient um, think like, I still have bowel pain. There must be a recurrence. And I think what really happens is that neuroinflammation from the disease that had been aggravating for so long, that's still driving the pain more than there's, not that there can't be a recurrence, but more than there's a recurrence, it's the soup that is still existing and stimulating the system. Dr. Mawad, any opinion on that? No, I completely agree with you. I think that's why when we talk about a comprehensive management of endometriosis, As surgeon, we're removing the generator of the disease or the pain or whatever, but there is a lot of follow-up with uh, central desensitization to readjust or readapt the perception of the brain to the painful stimuli, uh, the uh, uh, pelvic floor therapy to uh, remodel all their spasticity in the pelvis. Uh, The cognitive therapist could help into the Uh, the perception of pain and the resilience to pain. There are a lot of things that are intermingled. And I think the surgeon is only one part of the story. That might be an important part, but I think it's a a comprehensive approach of the disease that should be always uh, the way to treat patients with endometriosis, especially uh, complex endometriosis patients. Yes, Dr. Mangeshikar, what is it like um, for your population in India to get that comprehensive care? Because I think in the U.S. we're barely able to access it. What's it like in India? So strangely, it's a little easier in India because we don't have to go necessarily through the public health care system. We, most people have private insurance and private health care. And um, their accessibility to specialist care is a lot easier. Uh, They don't have to pay ridiculous out-of-network coverage fees or anything like that. So it's easy for patients to approach any doctor. 
And what the Indian Center for Endometriosis aimed to embody was to kind of recreate that team that we know multidisciplinary teams work for endometriosis just like they did for ovarian cancer to in, improve five-year survival rates. And for endometriosis, it's yes, surgery is a very integral part of it, but also more important is the follow-up of the patient and to look for any other triggering factors in the pelvic floor that can be missed. So physiotherapy plays a huge role in that, uh, nutrition to an extent, cognitive behavior, even pain management. And of course, if so desirous, we do also talk about fertility, but it's always important to understand segueing into the fertility part that the, removing the disease is the first step. Uh, I think a great amount of literature by Professor Roman and Bordeaux has shown that even colorectal disease or bowel disease uh, improves fertility outcomes, uh, whether they're via natural cycles or uh, whether ART procedures. And he also randomized patients to surgery first, followed by ART, and then patients directly to ART with diagnosed endometriosis and found that the removal of the disease also uh, favors reproductive outcomes in that sense. But coming back to your question, I think, yes. I think they published uh, another study following on that with uh, uh, Sofiane Bendifalla and Horace yeah. Roman. They published that and it, it validated the findings that excision of deeply infiltrative endometriosis not only improve the spontaneous fertility, but increases the success with IVF as well. So it's better than IVF before uh, surgery. Dr. Vidali, any opinion on that? Look, um, the, 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 the literature of IVF and endometriosis has been marred by uh, a decade of, I think, bad studies that were run by people that were not surgeons and, you know, really brilliant scientists. But uh, unfortunately, um, the problem with surgery is that studies on surgery is that to do a good surgical study, you have to have to do good surgery. And if you don't do, you know, and if the people <laughs> who are doing the surgical studies do not believe in surgery, so they don't execute the radical surgery that has to be executed for endometriosis, then the study is going to be flawed. And that's really has been like the, the huge dilemma of uh, the literature, certainly the literature of the of the late 90s and, and early 2000s in endometriosis, which really showed the limited evidence of the benefit of surgery in IVF, okay? And uh, and uh, now we're stuck with that because those are the only sort of randomized prospective studies that are out there and everything else following that has been limited. You know, actually the study that Abhishek just mentioned about uh, deep, uh, deep infiltrating rectal endometriosis and IVF is probably like one of the few where you have really evidence of, of the impact of surgery on IVF, believe it or not, because otherwise it's just pretty much non-existent. Whereas any one of us who does this knows that in our clinical practice, we see the evidence of this. So I think uh, it's a problem. I think it's a problem, the, the lack of decent work done with decent surgery. And, you know, I guess you know the what's job is ahead of us. Yeah, it's interesting sometimes to look at like the disclosure, just throwing this out there, the disclosures on some of those really bad studies. It's just interesting because the people doing good surgery, oftentimes, you know, maybe they're not, this, they don't have the same financial sources. Just saying, just no, throwing that out there. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to randomize patients for surgeons because like the no surgery arm is a very difficult arm to, in, in a study, you know, and that's really the, the huge dilemma. And um, we deal with this every day, right? Because uh, REIs right now are very much anti-surgery. IVF doctors are very much anti-surgery. And um, so it, it's, it's like I said, that we are a little bit behind the, the eight ball and it's difficult when, when patients ask you, show me the actual evidence, you don't have a whole lot of it to show. That's a reality. Scientific evidence we're talking about, right? You know, hardcore evidence, not, not a whole lot. All right, so we're gonna head over to um, some questions. Most of these, while we have not asked your question very specifically, we've gotten to um, a lot of these questions. So 
with bowel endometriosis, um, do you also see, do you see pain all the time? Do you see pain more during the period? Um, do you see pain at ovulation? Any one of you? Yeah, it's not necessary just during the period. It depends. It can be outside the period as well. So that's one of, that's a very good question. The first question I ask is out of 30 days in a month, how many days do you experience pain for? And then is it highest during the period or is it highest outside the period? And did we pain score on a scale, on a visual analog scale? And so that's the first part of the history taking. So yes, to answer your question, it's it can be any time. It's not nearly restricted to just during the period. Uh, and some patients can have pain chronically, so they can have pain every day of their life. And by the way, some patients do not have any symptoms, yeah. Yeah. which is uh, around 5% of bowel endometriosis, zero symptoms. You ask them the question and you repeat, you don't believe because you see the MRI and they say, no, 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 no. I also believe that unfortunately women are taught to normalize bowel symptoms. Like we're taught like now, like, oh, you're, you know, it's so funny because I um, am playing pickleball with some woman. The daughter is so sick and I don't want to open my mouth and be like, by the way, she has endometriosis because I don't want to be like that. Right. Oh. But she has like every symptom. And now it's like, oh, she went gluten free and all the, all now her stomach's fine. Her stomach is not fine just from going gluten free. And I think like, we normalize those symptoms or like today I was um, in a store buying a gift card and I was looking at a pair of pants and they're like, they're so good when you're bloated. Why are we designing clothing for when you're bloated? Like, why are we not addressing that you shouldn't be bloated in the first place? You know? So I think that um, a patient, and, and I had one, she was a silent infertility patient and she swore up and down. She never, she didn't have endometriosis. And then I said, like in college, did you have a lot of stomach? Ache? Oh, I, I've had constipation every day of my life. That's just how I am. No. You know, the normalization of bowel pain, and you'll see at the endometriosis summit, Chris Bobel is going to lecture really on like the history of the patriarchy and why we do normalize these symptoms and we don't move forward. Anyway, do you see Dr. Vidal, you must see that a lot working in um, infertility. This just normalization of, of stomach pain. Well, it's, it's, uh, the, the question is that the silent endometriosis really exist, you know, yeah. is it really a thing, you know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, um, possibly very minimal endometriosis, silent, possibly yes, but you know, for other patients, but I do agree with Gabby that sometimes you see people that have a tremendous disease load and very, very complain, very limited, very, or very limited symptoms. It's true. I have a question for our panelists. Patient who comes with chronic constipation with a long history of chronic constipation is does endometriosis cause chronic constipation? I know it's a very big question, and you know, with many ramifications, and, and I don't know that there is a direct answer, but I'd like to hear our panelists answer address this question because I think it's a common issue. Uh, chronic constipation sure can be one of the symptoms of endometriosis but you would also follow up a lot of questions about the history with when was the onset are there any exacerbating factors early onset, early onset, early teenage onset. Year, not even before pre-teenage year chronic constipation I, I'm sure Dr. Mawad would know um, the study offhand but I think there's a study that says um that is uh, like a very high percentage of teens with IBS actually have endometriosis. We're going to do teen endometriosis next week, so I will look it up. But there's a very high um, correlation of that. You, it begs the question, is it the endometriosis causing the constipation or is it the inflammatory process around the nerves that have grabbed a hold of the way the whole bowel empties and as well as how the pelvic floor works? Yep. Yeah, I can be smart too. You are, you are super amazing, Sally. No, I think, uh, Andrea, and it, it is as simple as that, as now we know there is a predominance of one-sided hypogastric for most of the symptoms. So uh, not where, where we thought in the past, like, oh, it's okay. If I cut the hypogastric nerve on this side, there will be still another nerve on the other side that will function. 
And this is most of the belief. Now we know that there is a predominance of one-sided hypogastric. So that's why nerve sparing is, is a must right now. Uh, and then you could have a teenager with an endometriosis lesion around that predominant side, and they could experience all their life a slower transit because of that lesion. So that could be one plausible explanation. I think we need to dig deeper to see uh, what's the percentage of chronic constipation and endometriosis. I think also like the patient that's been constipated that they come to you and they're 35 and they've been constipated since they were nine years old, they're not going to be fixed. Okay. You can remove the endometriosis on their bowel if that, you know, but they're not going to be fixed. Bye-bye. All fine from that one surgery, which it is why we push for earlier diagnosis, but that's a person you got to work on the microbiome. You got to work on the pelvic floor. You got to work on the central nervous system. You have to understand why the nerves around the bowel are inflamed. You know, I, I think the problem is that it's so hard to get care that they come to the endometriosis specialist and expect it all to be magic. Panelists, do adhesions cause constipation? Oh, there's a good one. Oh, finally, I said a good. I asked a good question, Sally said. <laughs> I'm just so happy I'm not looking at that bookshelf in your um, background. Oh, you love the cow. Oh, oh, you, oh, you don't want the bookshelf. All right, okay. No good. cow ever. No, sometimes like what I believe that, uh, Andrea, we have a lot of patients that comes with constipation and then they have like kinked bowel, like uh, an abnormal bowel tract because of adhesions. They don't have specifically, typically a endometriosis of the bowel. Once you release that adhesion, this is the first thing they say like, oh my God, the bowel movement are glorious. I can have bowel movement back to normal. We didn't touch their bowel. We just removed some of the uh, adhesions. But that's not very common though. Yeah, that I know. <laughs> it's very uncommon. I don't want you, I, I know you. that could happen, but we don't want people to think that that's a common event. Most of the time you cut the adhesion, they're still constipated. Okay, yeah. let's make it very clear. Yeah, yeah let's, let's, not promise, let's not promise people something that is very uncommon. Uh, let's be very clear on adhesion. So it's just, you know, a lot of patients come in with reports and they said, oh, I've got adhesions of the bowel to the back of the uterus where maybe the surgeon recognized the adhesion, but they didn't recognize the nodule in the bowel. Yep. So yes, of course, if there's a missed nodule that because the adhesions don't form by themselves, so there is something, some pathology causing it. Um, with regards to surgical adhesions, those are usually, if your surgery is clean enough and uh, you maintain hemostasis and dissect it on anatomical planes, even if adhesions form, they're very thin, filmy adhesions. I don't believe those will cause constipation. But disease producing, I mean, adhesions caused by disease, definitely, if they're causing infiltration into the bowel, will cause constipation. Now we'll have Delumba on who will, you know, have his own um, tale to tell about this. But I think um, the other thing about um, adhesions is it, we get caught in that the general practitioner is like, well, you went and had that crazy excision. So of course you're constipated. You have an adhesion, you know, like there's also sometimes that it's adhesion, it's adhesion, it's adhesion. And, and it could be a lot of other things. If you have a great functioning microbiota, the adhesion might not bother you, even though it's there. Also, we could have a whole live on do adhesions themselves cause pain. You know? I'm not that convinced. That, that statement is true. They're not innervated. They're not vascularized. So they won't cause pain. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah. All right. So we are winding down for the evening. This is our first Endo Summit Live. There was um, one question um, after we stopped the recording. We're going to try to get to that. It just doesn't fit. So we'll get to that. But it is our fifth year of the endometriosis summit. So um, tickets for the endometriosis summit are uh, currently on sale. Pre-sale will end and prices will go up January 1st. So you should buy tickets before that happens. It'll be in Celebration Florida, which is Orlando, um, or virtually online. Before we close out, Dr. Mawad, uh, highlight and what you're looking forward to for the endo summit. No, uh, I'm looking forward to that, again, direct communication with the uh, patients and then uh, seeing all my friends 
they're uh, catching up, teaching, learning, and then uh, understanding the novelty about endometriosis. It's always a great place to be with great people. And Dr. Mangeshikar will join us in person. How cool is wow. that? Wow. I know. Remember you were supposed to come two years ago and then it all yeah, was yeah. the bust? <laughs> oh, yeah. The greatest oh disruptor of His travel plans was a tiny It's so years. exciting that you're going to come in person. So um, I think, uh, what are you most looking forward to? Because you've never seen one yet. Oh, no well, pressure on my part. Virtually last year, which I'm sure will pale in comparison to the actual experience. So I'm looking forward to actually meeting a lot of you, Andrea, Sally, and my good friend Gabby, once again, who I've already met in person recently because he came all the way to India for a conference. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you all in the flesh and, uh, you know, getting a beer. <laughs> and more importantly, learning from all of the different specialties. I looked at the program, it looks brilliant, and I always enjoy learning uh, about endometriosis, especially from the non-surgical part of it, the other to approach it more holistically with the uh, physio, nutrition, the gut microbiome. There's a lot of interesting talks. And I think anybody who has anything to do with this disease should definitely be there because it's going to be, I mean, I'm, I'm coming there more to learn than to talk. We're so excited you're coming. So Dr. Mangeshikar and Dr. Mawad will participate in, um, we are introducing something called fireside chats because we decided surgical lectures were kind of boring. Um, and this way uh, there are teams paired together to discuss topics. So since the bo both of you are very into the nerves and the bowel and how everything works, we're going to see what you guys put together. It's going to be really, really cool because it'll be a lot like tonight, but you'll be able to add video and things like that. And it'll be really, really exciting. Dr. Vidali, what are you looking forward to the endometriosis summit? As usual, I'm looking forward to our unfiltered conversations. I mean, I think the greatest thing about the Endometriosis Summit is that a lot of conversations are unfiltered and uh, and people are uh, allowed to really say what they think uh, in a in an environment that is, uh, you know, also open. And uh, I think there's she's, Sally's going to show us the puppy, hopefully. And yes, there you go. And I'm looking forward to meeting the puppy in person, of course. But yes, unfiltered, unfiltered talks and real true opinions. Lovely, lovely puppy. Yes, that's Dolly, the new Endo Summit uh, mascot, who had her shots today. They did not wear her out and tire her out. So um, this is the first of a 14-week series. Next week, we were here with teen endometriosis. And I'd love to tell you who's coming, but I don't know who the faculty is yet. Um, but I know we will be discussing teen endometriosis as well as having a teen endometriosis workshop at Endo Summit Workshop. Uh, the replay sits on YouTube and we are so excited all of you could join us. Sally, are we? Is this going to be also on um, on uh, other platforms besides YouTube, or just to YouTube? 